But we have this morning a joyful and personal account of an unlikely man coming to salvation. The Lord working his ways to bring people to salvation. Acts chapter 8 is one personal account. Next week we'll have another personal account. The whole book of Acts is about preaching the gospel and people coming to salvation in large crowds and small crowds that the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus and life in his name might go forth. So please stand with me this morning to honor the Lord as we read Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, verse 28, and was returning, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azutis, and he passed through, uh, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Amen. <clears throat> Well, in verse 26, we have the angel of the Lord giving direction to Philip, his messenger or evangelist. The angel of the Lord in the scriptures is various things. Sometimes it refers directly to a word from the Lord. Sometimes it is an angel from the Lord. But either way, I want you to understand it's the same thing. Because an angel is one who gives a message from the Lord. Angels do not speak of their own. They come and carry a word from the Lord to people. And sometimes it is the Lord himself who carries that word to people. But either way, in this passage, God is speaking. And I want you to understand that God is directing Philip. God is seeking the salvation of this person that we're going to encounter this morning. And he tells Philip to go. He tells him to go down this road that leads to Gaza, out into the desert, out into the middle of nowhere, and he does not explain to him why he is sending him, or what the purpose is, or what the end of these things are going to be. He just says, go. And this is the way the Lord works all throughout the scriptures, that we want things explained to us in great detail, and God does not work that way. He does not explain why or what he is going to do. He didn't explain that with Abraham. He commanded Abraham to go and to leave his kin and his father's house and go into a foreign land and walk by faith, and eventually I will unfold this before you. Same with Moses. Go to Egypt, confront Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. Doesn't tell him what the end of this is going to be, how this is going to turn out. He just tells him to go. He tells the apostles to go to the nations and proclaim Jesus as Lord, proclaim the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He doesn't tell them how it's all going to work out. He tells them to go. And so he tells us to Philip, and verse 27 is very important. It says, and he rose and he went. This is called obedience. 
When God prompts us to do something and he presses our soul and we understand from Scripture that we ought to do something, we are brought to a place of making a decision. Philip is not like Jonah. Jonah ran the other direction when God called him to do something. And he had to be disciplined to be returned back into his path. Not so with Philip. He arises and he goes. And so the question that I have for you this morning, and it's a very important question, one of the main applications of this passage. Do you follow the leadings of the Lord based on the commands of Scripture? Let me ask you that question again. Do you follow the leadings of the Lord based upon the commands of Scripture? We have necessary direction of God's will coming to us through Scripture. This is called the revealed will of the Lord. When we spend time reading in the Scriptures, we're going to find all kinds of different commands of the Lord. Part of the great commission of Jesus Christ is to teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So there's plenty of commands that are there, plenty of things that have been revealed to us as to what God would have us to do according to his will. And that is where we begin to understand the will of God. Things such as, I would say the most important, is the command to repent of your sins and to believe in Jesus Christ. And then once we have come to Christ, there are many other commands, many other directions given to us by the Lord. And when we ask, what is God's will? It is God's will that you pray. It's God's will that you have a servant's heart. It's God's will that you live a sexually pure life. It's God's will that you be truthful, that you be patient, that you live in love and peace, that you be hospitable to strangers, all kinds of things like this that teach us about what God's will is. But when we come to Christ in salvation, we know that God's Spirit indwells our heart, that God's Spirit is near and even inside of us. And so what the Spirit of the Lord does is He takes the commands of the Lord from Scripture and applies those things to our heart and then leads us in certain directions. If you are a Christian here this morning, you know exactly what I mean. You know when your heart burns inside of you that you know you ought to say something or do something that is in accordance with Scripture. This is called leading from the Lord. And sometimes the leading of the Lord is in big things. Things related to, wow, I think I ought to change the whole direction of my life. I ought to start something, do something that I've never done before. And I feel this great passionate leading of the Lord that I ought to go do this. And it's in accordance with scripture. Or perhaps you're in a difficult place in your life, but you know you're exactly where God wants you to be. And the difficult part about it is staying where you are and continuing to do what the Lord would have you to do where you are. Everyone who is a Christian understands the great prompting of the Lord to say something about the gospel to a lost person. A person sitting in the seat right next to you with an open door to say something to them about Jesus. And there's this overwhelming sense of the Spirit of God urging you, say something about Jesus to this person. This is what it means to be led by the Lord in big things and then sometimes just small things. Small things of telling your child that you love them, giving your spouse a hug and a kiss instead of holding off from them, to be honest at work, all kinds of things like this. But for me personally, the way this has worked out is there was a time in my life where something, I I was led very strongly by the Lord according to scripture to do something and I did not do it. And when I did not do it, an opportunity was lost and I was, I, I knew that it was sin that I had not done what I was led to do by the Lord. And so made a personal commitment in my life years ago, and as imperfectly as I keep it, I strive towards this, that daily I will seek the Lord in Scripture, that I might understand what the will of the Lord is, that I will pray daily for wisdom and direction, and then that I will follow that direction, that I will do to the best of my ability what God is calling me to do. And it is amazing to me to look out over this congregation this morning. That that commitment was prior to this church coming into existence. The Lord builds his church. 
But this church has been built, as we're going to see, God uses messengers and people to accomplish his will. And when we say yes to the Lord and we follow the leadings of the Lord, he uses us in his will to accomplish things that we never, ever thought were possible, leading us in joyful paths. So I encourage you this morning to see the example of Philip being willing to go down a desert road to a place that he has no really idea what in the world God is leading him towards, but he arises and he goes. So as the passage unfolds, we see that the purposes of the Lord are related to the salvation of one person. And that's the next special point of this passage. The 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 way in which God brings people to salvation, I believe, is at least in three parts. One, it is always personal. Second, it is always providential. And third, it is usually by the means of a messenger. So let's work through those three things. First, the way in which the Lord brings people to salvation is always personal. God knows this Ethiopian man's name. He knows exactly who he is. He knows he's where he's traveling and what is happening in his life, even though Philip doesn't know the first thing about this person or where he is. Do you understand this morning that God knows your name? And he knows exactly who you are, and he knows exactly where you are, and what your life is about. He knows all the intimate details about your life. He knows your struggles, and the Lord Jesus loves you. The ministry of Jesus had two prongs to it, and it keeps going back and forth as you read the Gospels. One is the big picture of him standing up on the bow of a boat because there's so many people pressing in that he, he's got to get up out of the way or people are going to crush him. There's thousands of people everywhere as he preaches law, sermons, Sermon on the Mount, and various other things. But the other aspect of Jesus' ministry is that it's deeply personal. We have many accounts of Jesus meeting one-on-one -on -one with people and sitting down and taking time to answer their questions. Long lines of people late into the night as Jesus spends time personally one-on-one -on -one with people. Nicodemus, think of Zacchaeus, think of Mary and Martha. I love Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house today. He had no idea that that was going to happen, but Jesus knew Zacchaeus was up in that tree, and he had a plan to come and pursue his soul, which is exactly what we're going to see here with this man. The reading for you from Matthew chapter 18 related to Jesus and what he says about his ministry. He tells a parable, Matthew 18, 12 through 14. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish." It's an intense statement about the personal nature of the Lord seeking the lost one person at a time. We very much teach personal conversion in this church. You don't come to salvation as a group of people. You come to salvation one person at a time. Each person must repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. Each person enters into the kingdom of God one at a time. And so Philip is sent by God for the salvation of one man. But second, it is providential. And all of the working of God to bring people to salvation is by the power and the providential working of God. It is so clear from this passage that all of this is directed by God and initiated by God. Let us not forget what Jesus says in many different ways in the scriptures, but I think so clearly in John chapter 6, verses 44 and 65. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In verse 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. 
what we see in the outworking of this narrative passage is a person that is striving after the Lord, but cannot come to God unless the Lord acts in such a way to bring an interpreter, to bring someone to share the gospel with this person and open their heart that they might understand who God is. And so in his great personal love, the Lord sends a particular person to him to help him understand. But we see the drawing and the compelling work of the Lord God in the life of this eunuch prior to this occasion. Because it tells us in this passage that the eunuch had come all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. Why would he do this? There is something in the heart of this man where he knows that there is a God and it's not the God that they worship in Ethiopia and that there is some other God and somehow there has been a connection between the God of the Jews and this man has made a very long journey to come and worship something that he doesn't even really understand. And I know that there may be someone like that here today that is in this church right now. You don't know why you're here, but you have a compelling sense that there is a God and that what you have been doing in your life has not been sufficient and that perhaps here, perhaps from the scriptures, you can understand who God is and perhaps you have been reading the Bible and you don't understand what you have been reading and you need someone to help you understand it. That is what God is doing to save this man. But number three, it is always by the means of a messenger. I shouldn't say always. It is normally by the means of a messenger. Next week, we're going to see God preaching the gospel, Jesus preaching directly to Paul, and it's very effective. Uh, So we'll let uh, Clay talk about that next week. But the normal way in which the Lord Jesus has his word proclaimed is through a messenger. And so he sends Philip to this person as an evangelist, as a teacher, to explain the scriptures to him. The end is salvation. The means to that end is a preacher or a teacher of the scriptures. And so today we are looking at the scriptures. And today I'm trying to explain the scriptures to you that you might understand what you read. But we always go back to the scriptures. I don't have my own message. I don't proclaim my own word. Like Philip, I am trying to help you understand the salvation of God as it is presented to us in the scriptures. Well, in verse 27, it goes on and we have details about this individual, a lot of details about this individual. First is that he is an Ethiopian. In the Old Testament, the land that is now modern day Ethiopia has been an, an ancient land. But in the Old Testament, it was also referred to as the land of Cush, part of the Nubian kingdom, which was south of Egypt and the eastern horn of Africa, which also included modern day Sudan. It is spoken of directly by the prophet Isaiah earlier than where this man is reading. This man is reading from Isaiah chapter 53. But in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 10 and 11, Isaiah speaks about the root of Jesse. The root of Jesse means that the the heritage of Christ came through the heritage of David, that Jesus was a descendant of David, a promised descendant of David. Let me read for you in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pethros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. A very interesting passage that is partly fulfilled in what we're going to read here today. That the descendant of the promised descendant of David, the Messiah that was promised and was to come, would reach out to the people of Cush, the land of Ethiopia. And so this is a man from that land. It tells us that he is a eunuch, which is important and interesting because in Deuteronomy chapter 23, Eunuchs were not allowed to enter into the the place of the Lord because of the damage done to their body. 
But now in the New Testament, we see all the law, all the, the commands of God fulfilled in Christ. And we see Jesus reaching out to all the poor and all the broken and those that were outside the, the, the way in which the Lord would have them to be, bringing them in that they might be forgiven and made whole in Christ Jesus. It tells us that he served the court of Candace, queen of Ethiopia. Uh, Candace is not a personal name. Candace is a, is a dynastic name. So for many, many generations in Ethiopia, the, the queens of Ethiopia were known as a Candace, sort of like a pharaoh or something like that, just not a name that we're used to hearing. And so this man served the queen of Ethiopia as the treasurer. A man of wealth, of importance. He's in this entourage in his own chariot, you know, cruising along the, uh, the road from Jerusalem to Gaza back to Ethiopia. Because he has come to worship. He has this sense that there is a God. And something about the God of the Jews is true, though he does not understand it. But we remember the words of Jesus. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. And so he has been seeking. He has come all the way to Jerusalem to worship a God that he does not fully understand. He is seeking after the Lord, and the Lord is meeting him where he is. And so Philip, as he obeys the Lord and goes down this desert road, encounters this man on this road. And a further prompting of the Lord, go and join this chariot. This is the, you need to share the gospel with this person prompting. So he goes over next to this chariot and he hears this man reading uh, the, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And it's important how to see there, there is an art, a wisdom and an art to encountering people with the gospel. And not just coming in with something that's harsh or heavy. He comes in and asks a very good basic question. Hey, uh, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no, I have no idea what I'm reading. And unless somebody explains this to me, how am I supposed to know what I'm reading? It's a great question, and it opens up an, a conversation for the gospel. Philip becomes the teacher, the interpreter of the scriptures. There are countless people in this world, when they open the scriptures and they read it, they have no idea what it says. It's a complete mystery to them. And yet the scriptures are there, and many open it that do not understand what is being said there. But it's important to see that in this passage, we have a person of great standing, of great wealth, but of enough humility of heart to say, I don't understand what I'm reading. Will you please help me? Two questions that come out of this for me. The first is for those of us that are in this place that are Christians, could you answer this basic question? If someone was reading this passage of scripture and they ask you, can you help me understand what this passage of scripture means? Could you explain this passage of scripture? Do you know where it comes from in the Bible? If you don't, then you can there's not, this is not full mystery here. You can learn. This comes from Isaiah chapter 53, and it speaks about Jesus. It, it speaks about the incarnation, what we're lighting up here. Look at that. We're missing a candle. Oh, well, I like the light. Oh, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> uh, these candles are lit about the advent of, no, oh, well, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> The coming of Christ Jesus. So Isaiah 53 was all about the, the promised coming of the Messiah. There is no coincidence that this man was reading this passage at this moment in time. It's all providential. It's a work of the Lord. That the Lord leads him to read this. Philip comes alongside him at that very moment in time. He says, let me explain this to you. The passage that he's reading is about Jesus and the coming of the Messiah. And he goes straight into a gospel conversation about the Messiah. And he explains to him the gospel. And so can you answer questions about the scriptures to those who ask you? You can learn about the scriptures. For some reason in our day and age, many, many people think that these things just don't matter. I've got so many things to pursue in my life. They're way more important than understanding the Bible, way more important than understanding about God. And so they go through their life gaining a great many things, knowledge about all kinds of stuff, but they have little or no understanding of who God is. Why would we want that? Why would we think that the things of God are simple to grasp? If there is a God, it should be obvious that entering into the mind of the divine would not be a simple thing. 
that this is something that would take great concentration, care, and discipline, that it would come only with great effort and with study and with careful thinking. Why do we think that they can be whatever they want to be in light of who God is? And so I encourage you, this man asks a question about what does the scripture say? As Christians, we can make progress in understanding the scriptures that we might help others come along in their understanding of God. And so the passage that's being read here is from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. Now, we would assume that on this long carriage ride that this person has read this entire chapter, but for whatever reason, there is the citing of these couple of verses. The whole chapter speaks directly about the coming of the Messiah. Philip opens his mouth, it says, and speaks to him about these things. Let me read for us a few other verses from Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, Verses 3 through 8 I'd like to read as well. He, or the coming Messiah, the promised one, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that, was, that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Isaiah is speaking about Jesus to come. And we can see these things now that we are past this, this whole idea of him being pierced for our transgressions upon the cross, him being declared guilty when he was innocent, the idea of him being the lamb of God. And so Philip begins to explain and proclaim these things to this man as they go along this road. And I want you this morning to understand that Jesus is the lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. In the Old Testament, there is a series of sacrifices, a series of of things that are spoken of as shadows, but those things are not substance. Christ Jesus is the substance of all the things that the Old Testament point towards. He is the reality of sacrifice. He is the one that met the justice of God in his own life. None of us can meet the justice of God because we ourselves are all under that condemnation. Because every single person here is a sinner. And every single person has their own real guilt before God. But not so with Christ Jesus. In his perfect life, he deserved no punishment. And so he goes before Uh, the Lord, and takes the punishment of sinners upon his own life that the justice of God might be met, that the forgiveness of Christ might be poured out. He was the suffering servant, Emmanuel, God with us. He who humbled himself to come down and to be amongst us, to live in our midst. This is a unimaginable humbling of God that he might be personally near to us. Something so worth dwelling on and thinking about. His humility before Pilate, one who knows that he is innocent, continues to interrogate him and in the end declaring him to be innocent and yet sending him to the cross. His life was taken away. He was, as it says in Isaiah 53, pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. As it is explained by Philip, He speaks to him about the resurrection of the dead and of baptism. We don't have the whole sermon here. Uh, Whenever it says, and it often uses this phrase in the scriptures, that a person, as it says in verse 35, 
opened their mouth and starts talking about Jesus, connecting the Old Testament with the New Testament and helping them understand all that is going on. This is what Philip is doing with this Ethiopian man. So at some place along the way, he comes to salvation. He earnestly and eagerly believes in what is explained to him. This longing of his heart now has substance to it that he might believe it. And in the continuous pattern of the New Testament, he is eager for baptism. All throughout the New Testament, and especially the book of Acts, we have this unbroken pattern of people coming to salvation, believing in Christ Jesus, and then wanting to join with him in baptism. The symbolism that we will see here today of a person being put under the water and being brought back out, the symbolism that relates to a person being joined with Christ in his death and in his resurrection in a public way so that everyone can see your association with Jesus Christ. And so they come along and they see in verse, um, let's see, 38, that they see a pond by the road. And I think it should not be overlooked that you've got a person of great stature in a court going along in this royal entourage that now wants to be baptized in a pool by the side of the road. Now, I've seen a lot of pools by the side of the road. None of them have ever been beautiful or perfectly clean or anything like that. But this person in front of all of his entourage wants to be associated with Jesus and wants to obey Jesus in baptism right now. So there's water. Why can I not be baptized right now? He's initiating this. And that's a great question. And Philip says there's no reason why not. This is not a spontaneous baptism. Some people use this passage to teach that. There has been who knows how many hours of talking about Jesus as they cruise down the road before this man comes to salvation. There is one verse, I think it's worth pointing out here, verse uh, 37, which is not in many of your Bibles because in the transcripts that we have of the scriptures, the earliest manuscripts of the Bible do not have verse 37 in it. And so it is not a verse that changes anything about the passage, but you can look at your footnotes and what, uh, if you have a King James Bible, which is based off of some of the later translations of scripture, it says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is nothing that is out of the ordinary for what we would expect, but it is just not in the earliest manuscripts of the Bible. But it makes perfect sense that Philip would have asked him just that. Are you earnest in your faith? Having just come off of Simon from last week, someone that was not earnest in their faith, and he is earnest in his faith. And so they go down into the water. I always emphasize this because in the New Testament, there is no sprinkling baptism. Uh, I, it, it is symbolic, and I understand that it's not something that we're going to, to live or die on here. But we want to follow after what the scriptures, what the pattern of the scriptures are in the New Testament. And they go down into the water to be baptized. And then they come back out of the water after Philip has baptized him in this water. And then the Spirit of the Lord, it says, carries him away in verse 39, which is highly unusual, but I think is for a particular reason in this passage. He was sent by God as a messenger to preach the gospel to this person. He preaches the gospel to this person, he comes to salvation, and the Spirit of the Lord moves him away to some other place, I believe, to further authenticate to this man that Philip was sent by God to preach to him this gospel. Because what happens with this man in church history, and now history all the way today, is that this person travels back to Ethiopia, and he there begins to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ethiopia has one of the oldest, most ancient uh, Christian communities in all the world. There has been an unbroken Christian heritage in Ethiopia from this time to the present day for thousands of years. He goes back to Ethiopia to proclaim a, a new thing to these people, but he goes back white hot and passionate about Jesus Christ, and it takes root. And this command of Jesus to take the gospel to the ends of the earth is now fulfilled in what we see here by the Lord sending out a man to his own people, to his own kind, that they might see and hear an evangelist in their own language proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we close this morning, 
I want to remind you that God is still at work saving the lost. He is still personally bringing people to himself one at a time, one name at a time. He is still providentially at work in our midst. He still uses his word and he still uses a preacher and a teacher and a messenger that people might come to salvation. So whichever side you're on here this morning, if you're a Christian, may this encourage you to follow after the leadings of the Lord and be used of God in the hearts of the people that are around you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, believe in him this morning. Trust that Christmas is not about a bunch of presents and lights and things like this. The purpose of this season is to focus on the fulfillment of prophecy, that there was a Savior prophesied and a Savior that has come, a Savior that has ascended into heaven and will come again. I invite you to believe in Jesus this morning as your Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this passage this morning. We exalt Jesus as Lord, and I thank you for what we see in the scriptures before us this morning. I thank you that you know our names. I thank you that you pursue us by your work. I thank you that you have given us your word that we might understand who God is and that you have never left us without faithful teachers down through the ages that they might impart to us an understanding of scripture Lord, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit down through the ages and today in this church. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.